Can I welcome everyone to the 32nd meeting of the Education Skills Committee in 2017 and can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices on to silent for the duration of the meeting. The first item of business is our third evidence session as part of the early scrutiny of the Scottish Government's proposed education reforms. Our meetings over the last two weeks have included very interesting evidence sessions from academics and experts. Today we are hearing from Education Scotland. The primary focus of this session will be the proposed change to its roles under the proposed reforms. This week, can I welcome Gail Gorman, Chief Inspector of Education and Chief Executive, Graeme Logan, Strategic Director, and Mike Ewart, Non-Executive Board Member, Education Scotland. And I'd like to begin by congratulating Gail Gorman on your new role. I understand that this is just your second week in the job, so <laughs> yes, yeah. we thought we'd get you uneasy. Uh, for the benefit of those watching, I should mention that Gail was until recently a Director of Education and Children's Services at Aberdeen City Council, an improvement leader at the Northern Alliance. Ms Gorman, I understand you will make a short opening statement. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, thank you for the opportunity to appear here today. Um, as you, you stated, um, last week, last Monday, I took up my post as Chief Inspector of Education and Chief Executive of Education Scotland. Um, being so new in, the, new in the role, I'm therefore joined today, as you said, um, by Graham and Mike, um, who I know, Graham, you'll know from previous um, appearances here at the committee. Mike Ewart is a non-executive who sits on our um, advisory management board. Um, I'm committed to working for Scotland's children with Scotland's educators and it's a real privilege and honour to have taken up this post and to have the opportunity to speak to you so early um, in, in my tenure. Um, I believe that Education Scotland needs to continue to focus on teaching and learning, um, supporting classroom and community practitioners to really make a difference to children and young people in their daily work. We need to create a collaborative learning community across Scotland through refreshing the profession and empowering our teachers and practitioners to be inquiry-led um, practitioners. We need to keep a central focus on getting it right for every child and the totality of children's lives and experiences. And we need to provide assurance and evidence through inspection that, that focuses on research at its centre, sharing best practice, learning from within and across Scotland and from elsewhere. And we must re-engage and reshape Education Scotland and the sector on improvement, um, working in partnership with all our stakeholders on our shared improvement aim to improve the outcomes for children and young people in Scotland. We'll do that through working locally, regionally and nationally with a clear purpose to reshape the organisation, to meet the needs of the systems and to deliver excellence and equity for all Scotland's children. So I'm pleased at this very early stage in my appointment to have the opportunity to engage with you and my colleagues and I are happy to answer your questions today. Thank you very much and uh, I wish you well in your, your new position. Uh, I'll begin the questions before inviting contributions from other members. Can you explain where curriculum support will sit once the regional improvement collaboratives become fully operational? Thank you. Um, so reg regional collaborations will work in partnership with Education Scotland and with local authorities, of which they are consistent members. And curriculum support will be led through the Regional Improvement Collaborative Plans, um, whether that be literacy, numeracy, health and wellbeing, the eight core areas. That will be supported by colleagues from Education Scotland, who once the plans are, are scoped and, and fully written, that work is underway, we will then align our resources to meet the requests and needs of each local regional collaborative. Now that not, won't be one size fits all because every region is very different and the needs will be very different, but we'll bring together in a collective collaborative leadership piece, the strengths of each region locally, and then also bring to that the national agenda and the national team to add to that and extrapolate and then share that practice about the curriculum through that model. Is, is there anybody else got a comment to make there? No? no? Okay, thank you. The, so from what you're saying then, it's, you don't perceive it as being a, a top-down education. Scotland are saying it's going to be the regional collaboratives come up with their plan and your role will be to facilitate that? I think it's got to be a combination of both. If we want a school-led, teacher-led system, we have to work in partnership with our colleagues locally uh, at schools, particularly as well, um, who will be feeding into the collaboratives and uh, helping and requesting the support that they would like to see at classroom and at practitioner level, as well as taking our evidence from inspection 
we would be able to bring that evidence national picture from inspection, what the gaps are, where there are issues, where there are successes, and to feed that into the system. So very much a collegiate collaborative approach to that going forward is how we would want to shape the organisation and work in partnership. And how do you see the establishments of the regional collaboratives affect the way that Education Scotland works? Well, it's, it's, it's a significant change um, and one that certainly I welcome uh, in terms of being able to, to create that shared space to actually pool resources, take our collaborative learning from frontline um, teachers, practitioners, um, everyone in the sector to bring it together in one place to review where the gaps and issues are and then collectively to design programmes, evidence-based, research-based that deliver improvements for young people. Yes, just to add to that, convener, good morning, everyone. Uh, we've started to transform the way we do our business planning to, to accommodate that. So at the moment, we do nine national programmes, and we're scaling that right back um, to, to, to streamline our national offer so that the, the bulk of our work, bulk of our staff, can contribute to the regional improvement plans. So in other words, rather than us developing these nine big programmes, we will match staff expertise in a responsive way to the needs in the, the regional collaborative. So that is quite a dramatic change in how that we both plan and deliver our work. So the whole delivery model of the organisation needs to change. The days of, sort of staff sitting at the centre, producing things, putting them on our website are, are over. Uh, we will produce the guidance that's needed, but that will be kept very streamlined and staff will be out working with our partners and local authorities and schools in the regional collaboratives. Thank you. Gillian and um, Good morning, and it's nice to welcome you, Gail, from Aberdeen City down to Education Scotland. I think it would be very helpful, given that you were involved in the Northern Alliance so fundamentally, to give um, an overview of how the Northern Alliance worked. And I know you're making the point that one size doesn't fit all, fits all, in, and that, that's fine. But obviously, the Northern Alliance had uh, an ethos behind it and a way of working, which has probably been a precursor for a regional um, collaborative. Could you give us an overview of what the Northern Alliance is and how it worked? Yeah. Um, so the Northern Alliance is a collaborative of eight local authorities uh, from across predominantly the north of Scotland. And um, we came together uh, about eight, four years ago, just over four years ago, um, originally um, focusing on, on shared issues that we had and how we could look at those collectively. At the time it was, it was teacher recruitment and teacher numbers. Um, and then very quickly realised the strength of that collaboration, um, given our geography and our scale. Um, we then looked at what are our common issues around curriculum, around children's outcomes and approaches, and decided to share our expertise with each other. Um, we're all very different sizes. Highlands are a very large authority, for instance. Um, Shetland's a relatively small authority. Murray, scale and size. So perhaps we had one resource in one local authority that maybe we couldn't match in another. And we decided to become that collective, collaborative community of learners and share that expertise. In doing that, we formed relationships. We um, formed um, relationships at all layers in the system, so at director level, but also very much at head of service, service manager, and at school level. And we began um, targeting on three key priorities, early literacy, early numeracy, and uh, po poverty, and collectively designed programmes that all our schools, and we targeted some of those programmes at set schools, could then have access to and work collectively to create a network across the region. That now, there are more than 15 programmes that the Northern Alliance runs, involving um, hundreds of teachers and practitioners. And we're sharing that collective expertise. We're learning from each other, creating um, teacher networks, support networks, and also professional collaboration to really impact on, on children's outcomes. Um, so it's been a very positive model that has um, grown and strengthened over time. Um, and is now moving into being um, the, the full definition of the Regional Improvement Collaborative. So how, uh, in, in areas where we're going to have the new regional um, collaboratives, how are, are you going to ensure... I mean, that's quite an organic change. You know, you, you say you started looking at rec teacher recruitment and then it grew into something organically. H how can we um, ensure that there is that organic growth that's right for the other regions that are starting up afresh? Um, I think obviously timescales you know, are, are different and, and are challenging, 
But interestingly, there are many other collaborations that have always been in place across Scottish education. So um, I know the Tayside Collaborative, for instance, have been working together for some time now as well. Um, there's developments with the other collaboratives. There have always been you know, groups that have got together and local authority pairings and groups. So people are building and establishing and, and taking that base and growing it. Um, we certainly um, will be supporting, and, and even in the last eight days, Graham and I have been involved in talking to some of our other um, uh, regional improvement collaborative leads um, and supporting them in, in developing a plan, working on an iterative process with them, because they'll be able to scale up their activities over time, but very much focusing on the core agenda that we all have in terms of, of proving improving attainment for young people. What do you think the regional collaboratives are going to mean for a teacher on the ground? Well, I hope it means um, more equity of access to professional learning and development. Um, as I said, you know, one of the issues is sometimes scale, size and resource. So being able to look at that across a region will allow us and teachers to have access to that kind of consistency of approach, resource and uh, opportunity for learning. I think for teachers also, the connection, certainly my old head teachers and teachers said that the opportunity for them to make a connection with a school in Shetland or a school in Argyll and Butte, actually to develop that professional relationship, almost a families of schools approach. So, you know, if you're at one school of a certain type in a local authority that's relatively small, the fact you could find a partner school who's pretty similar to your school somewhere else has huge strength in terms of professional capacity and, and learning. Yeah, thanks, Gail. I think also we have there's an agreement between the Scottish Government and COSLA and partners on the, the core functions of, of the collaboratives. And at the moment, our evidence suggests that there is too much variability in the quality of support um, across Scotland. So this is an opportunity to, to provide the support, the curricular support, the improvement support that, that schools and, and local authorities need. But as Gail said, in our discussion with regional leaders, we've been very clear that as the planning process develops, it needs to, the, the offer to schools has to be very, very clear and very practical. And as the plans develop, taking the example of the, the Northern Alliance, then we, we hope to make sure that head teachers and teachers are very clear on what this means to them and who they can contact for particular types of support at a regional level. And just my final question in this, how are you going to monitor the progress of the, the new collaboratives? So, um, obviously we are working with them in terms of developing the plans, and so we'll be, you know, we have a regional liaison officer that have now been appointed to the six regional improvement collaboratives. They will have a brokering and link role to work with the uh, collaboratives and to feedback information to ourselves in terms of requests for support or additional help or needs. And then when the plans are submitted, there will be the formal sign-off process, but we are seeing that as a phased collaborative uh, uh, approach that we, we would be saying to local authorities, making up the collaboratives, these are the right lines, perhaps you'd like more development in this area, perhaps we could help. Other national partners as well coming to the table and adding to that, Care Inspectorate and others. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've got a number of people that want to ask questions around this theme, so it'll be Liz, then Tavish, and then I've got... Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Mrs Gorman, I wonder if you could um, talk to us a little bit about accountability for decision-making. Um, uh, a year ago, when uh, Education Scotland were before this committee, when the Curriculum for Excellence was very much the centre of discussions, um, I think we were finding it a little difficult to know who was responsible for key decisions in strategy. And I wonder if you could explain to us um, I mean, the Cabinet Secretary is very clear that he has overall uh, command of that, but where everybody else fits in, if there is to be a new, newly reformed Education Scotland, where the lines of accountability are, and particularly in relation to the collaboratives that you've just spoken about, um, at a time where we are devolving more power to head teachers, could you explain where the lines of accountability are for uh, decision making in education? Um, I'll, I'll make a, a start and then uh, uh, colleagues will, will join in in terms of some of the nuances of Education Scotland. So policy, as, as you are well, well aware, um, sits with um, the Cabinet Secretary and, and with government. And Education Scotland is very much there to look at implementation, support, curricular support, guidance for schools and other um, areas of the sector around the best way to implement um, curriculum for excellence, the best way to improve outcomes, and to really focus on the impactful delivery of good quality teaching and learning. Graham. 
Thanks, thanks, Gail. Um, just to follow that up, obviously we are at a period of change in, in governance, uh, Ms Smith, and the new Scottish Education Council has met for the first time, of which we're a member, and is developing its own remit and role as, advi as an advisory uh, council to, to ministers. And obviously there's other groups as well, the Curriculum and Assessment Board at the first meeting last week started to discuss how the board wants to oversee the curriculum and, and the role and remit. So I think we'll see those, those roles and remit uh, firmed up. Um, and, and at the moment, as we know, the statutory duty for improvement does sit with both ministers and local authorities. Um, and at Education Scotland, we're in the process of developing a new corporate plan, which will shortly come out for consultation and will set out very clearly uh, the outcomes and the, the, the areas that Education Scotland is responsible to for, and we want to make that as clear as possible so that members and the public um, can see what Education Scotland is about, what our purpose is, and the outcomes that we are responsible for uh, delivering over, over the next year. Can, can I just probe a bit further on that? Um, the Cabinet Secretary is very keen indeed about greater autonomy for head teachers, policy I support very much. Um, but obviously that means that uh, there will be less power in uh, the hands of local authorities in the way that they have just now. Do I understand that the Scottish Government and its new council, of which Education Scotland is part, will be deciding education policy and that the collaboratives, local government and head teachers are all expected to adopt that strategy? Sorry, Graham. Um, so the Scottish Education Council, we met for the first time um, roughly about 10 days ago, something like that. Um, and the role and remit for, for that council was very clear. It's not a decision-making body. It's a consultative group who will work together and feedback um, from various stakeholders on what are the wicked issues, for want of a better phrase, in Scottish education. And for uh, it's an opportunity for the Cabinet Secretary then to hear that, um, what the issues are, what people's views are, and then it would be for, for him to, d to decide how that was taken forward. Sorry, Mr. Hogan, did you yeah, um, Thanks, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, it's very clear that policy responsibility sits with ministers and with the Scottish Government, and the Council has an advisory function. Obviously, within that policy framework at present, if we take Curriculum for Excellence, there's a lot of autonomy and flexibility built in for local decision making. And obviously we await with interest to see how areas like the Head Teachers Charter emerge. There's a consultation on that at the moment. And uh, we will be making an uh, official response to the consultation on the Education Governance Bill before uh, the, clo the close of that. So, Mr Logan, can I, can I just uh, probe again a wee bit further on this? Uh, at the meeting last December, um, when we talked a lot about the delivery of the Curriculum for Excellence, there were a lot of concerns from members in, in the committee asking about who was responsible for key decisions uh, within the Curriculum for Excellence, particularly a couple where things had not worked out. And I think we've, we found it quite difficult to know who was responsible. In the, in the changes that are coming uh, forward for new governance, I think everybody, whether they're a parent or a teacher or a pupil, want to know exactly who is making the decisions that will affect them in their school and what happens uh, in terms of accountability. I'm still a little bit unclear about where these lines are, particularly, as I say, if head teachers have much greater autonomy and the regional collaboratives have a new relationship, um, obviously with local government, they will have a new relationship with Education Scotland. Can, can we just be absolutely clear about what's going to happen in terms of the decision-making process, who will finally be responsible and accountable to whom? Um, I think that um, at the moment, that's, there's a number of consultations, as Graham mentioned out. So obviously the Head Teacher Charter being one of those central ones um, currently. Obviously the Education Bill um, consultation is active and, and live at the moment. And we are developing an, in Education Scotland a corporate plan where we will really clearly articulate in terms of our role moving forward. But some of that will be based on the decisions that are made by the Scottish Government on the, at the end of those consultations. I think, can I just finish on the, sorry, I just finish on the point. We, we had um, 
two witnesses last week make the point that while everybody was united behind the principles of curriculum for excellence, uh, it had lost its way a little bit. It was struggling to uh, convince people in terms of exactly what it meant. Would you be able to tell us why you think the new structure will improve both the definition of curriculum for excellence and its delivery? Um, I, I'm not sure I would fully correlate with, with the, the, the statement that, that, that began there around CFE. I think there's still some inconsistency around CFE. I think that um, we need to do further work around clarity um, for frontline teachers who are very busy and actively engaged in learning every day and uh, the challenge that that is in, in serving our young people the best that they can. So some of the streamlining work that's going on around the benchmarks, some of the reduction in guidance, etc. I certainly want to be continuing that narrative under my tenure and scaling things back and providing a real clarity for teachers about the next step in learning. Because actually, as a classroom practitioner, what you really need to focus on are the young people in front of you and actually the gaps in their learning and we must support teachers professional learning in terms of using CFE really being able to see the progression in core skills and any advice or information that's there driving that and supporting it and taking away um, some of the confusion there may have been in the past and uh, lots of good work has already started and, and taken place on that. In terms of guidance for, for frontline practitioners, it will really make a difference if actually there's the core messages that we stick to, there's core guidance, and there's a consistency of approach, and the networking between schools is very, very, very important, and regional collaboratives will allow that professional dialogue to really be established and strengthened over time. Bish. Um, first of all, welcome to your post. I think you've got one of the toughest jobs in the public sector, if I may say so. Um, and they're not your fault, but there's a lot of stuff that went on in the past, which Liz has frankly hinted at, uh, which I think lots of us are really sceptical about. So I think you've got a big job to do, but good luck with it. Um, I actually wanted to ask you um, about the point you made early on uh, in recognising along Julie Martin's line of questioning about regional collaboratives taking different approaches across the country. You'll well know from the Northern Alliance that in, in many rural areas we have teaching heads for primary schools in particular. They don't have time for yet more governance going on. They just like time to teach and to learn. So if a regional collaborative comes to you and says, I'm terribly sorry, Chief Inspector, our primary schools don't, do not want this imposed on them, this governance stuff imposed on them right now, and here's why, and here's all the evidence about learning. Will you accept that? Um, I think it's about listening to the profession. I'm very much, I spoke to our Education Scotland team yesterday about listening to the profession, about remembering what it's like to be a teacher every day mm, and the exactly. pressures that that brings. Actually, as, as a teacher myself, as a professional, we always want to learn. We always want to learn from each other. We always want to do the best for our children and young people. And so I think if the regional collaborative's approaches are about practical support for teachers and head teachers, certainly my experience is that head teachers welcome that. It's not about a governance, it's about support or guidance or a quick win that another school's already learned from so you don't go down a blind alley. Certainly that's, in my professional experience, what professionals are looking for is that collaboration and that support and that's certainly what I'd want to be driving and seeing um, demonstrated in the regional plans. Yeah, I, I think, that, I, mean, I, think I, I take that, but uh, in Shetland, most of our primary school heads teach they do. and they do not have time to deal with all this other stuff that mm -hmm. is in these consultations flowing in on top of them and nor do they want it. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to teach and, and give the best chance to their kids. What I'm actually asking you is, will you reflect that when the Cabinet Secretary says, I want, to, I want this teacher's charter across the whole of Scotland, will you reflect that as you advise that Cabinet Secretary, uh, will, you, will you reflect that to, to him saying, look, we've got situations across the whole of Scotland here where schools aren't ready for this that they don't want to take this on right now, and you cannot impose it from such and such a date. Do you, un you understand that distinction about recognising how I hard do. it is for heads who teach to suddenly take on all these extra roles? Absolutely. Um, my, my role is very much to be that professional advice, yeah. and I will continue to, to voice my professional advice as, as I go forward, as I have throughout my career. Yeah, good. Well, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, can I ask you to, uh, if you've given some thought yet in 10 days, um, to the split between primaries and secondaries um, and how these governance proposals will, could potentially impact on them? because there seems to me a huge difference, again, between people uh, between the primary and secondary sector. We've had that in evidence in the last couple of weeks. Do you think that's a legitimate concern, and how would you see that uh, being reflected by regional collaboratives? 
Um, I think we have to be very mindful of the points that, that you raised um, uh, exactly in your, in your earlier question. Um, we have to be mindful of, of the impact on all head teachers. Being a head teacher is a hard job. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, it's about running your school and, and supporting the children, families, and community that you serve. And we have always got to keep that in the forefront of our support and, and, and focus. And I think there are different asks of different sectors. Yeah. And that's okay. That reflects the uniqueness of each sector, including early years and childcare as well. Yeah. So we would want to see that represented in the scale and approach of each um, regional collaborative. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think the, the sentiment of the, the head teachers charter about empowering head teachers to be leaders of learning is the right one. And as it develops, we need to make sure that it becomes a mandate for head teachers to do the job that they want to do. And as you say, Mr. Scott, I mean, I was in Shetland a few weeks ago, there's unique challenges in different parts of the country. And we have to make sure that um, all schools have the support they need. And if the regional collaboratives deliver, then we will know that head teachers, if they want support with literacy, they'll know who to go to uh, at a local or regional level. So it will improve uh, the current level of variability. In terms of the primary and secondary sector, I think that there are split views because some secondary schools have already more support because they might have a business manager, whereas primary is uh, not necessarily the case. So I think we do need to continue the dialogue with the profession and make sure that these changes enable them to do the job that they all want to do as best they possibly can. Mm -hmm. A um, couple of final questions, if I can, Kavina. Uh, you mentioned earlier on about aligning resources. I think in your opening remarks you said about aligning resources to regional improvement collaboratives. What does that mean in practice? Does so, that mean people and money going to a regional collaborative to help them get the job done? It exactly means that. We are looking at the deployment of um, our current central teams, many of whom are based locally and attainment advisors and, and inspectors have always worked in local contexts. But one of the, the pieces of work um, going forward now is looking at when the regional collaborative plans are, are scoped up a little bit more, what's their ask of us? What do they say their gaps are? And how can we realign the majority of our curriculum teams in front of, to support that local delivery? That's very much the focus of the change in Education Scotland going forward. And do you think we'll end up with, I don't know, a, a group of professionals in, say, Aberdeen or wherever the Northern Alliance may be based? There'll be a row about that, no doubt. But wherever it's going to be based, who will practically be in that place and, and there'll be a budget there and they will then be responsible for, for assisting the local... I the certainly think we'll have, we already have, in some instances, if I use the example of the Northern Alliance, three of our core programmes, the attainment advisors from Education Scotland have been involved in those for, for over two years and are part of the steering group for those literacy, numeracy and secondary mathematics programmes. They've been part of that, they've helped shape it and they're out there co-delivering. So already that's happening in practice and the attainment advisors, the majority of them are based in local authorities across across Scotland. So I'd see very much that model developing. That'll continue. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, then Richard. So uh, my question is very much one, but, but, but can I also uh, just acknowledge that uh, coming before a parliamentary committee on your ninth day in a new job is uh, somewhat of an intimidating task. So I, I, I hope, hope we're being kind to you this morning. Um, uh, so I'm very interested in how the regional improvement collaboratives will work. And I think critical to their functioning is clearly going to be the regional improvement plans, which are under development and, and will be published early in the new year. Could you just maybe explain to me how they are being uh, uh, put together, what they will look like in broad terms, and can I also just find out what, what opportunities there's been for practitioners and local schools to actually feed into those up the way, so to speak? Okay. Um, so uh, most of the, the, regional, the six regional collaboratives have appointed a regional improvement collaborative lead from the local authorities, um, mainly director level. They are coordinating the work of the various directors and teams in each local authority, along with chief executives as well, and uh, in, case, in most cases also the convener or chair of the relevant committee for that as well. They're working and looking at, they're doing a performance um, overview, a contextual piece about the performance across the region. So looking at um, inspection data, but also looking at um, CFE, looking at curriculum gaps, um, bringing in things like community planning and maybe some of the health uh, indicators, not just education fields. Uh, so they're doing a performance piece, they're looking there. From that, they'll extrapolate what are the key priorities for the region and um, decide which ones they can focus on in the first phase of their development. As um, mentioned earlier, you know, people are at different phases and at different stages. 
Um, and so they'll identify their key priorities and then work up a, an actual improvement plan for the region that says this is our key focus, say, for example, on numeracy in primary four. We're going to target that. That's a key area for us. There's an issue around um, mathematics, mathematics anxiety in, in teachers and in children and young people. We are going to use this model. We're going to target. I'm going to run so many events for teachers. We're going to work in schools. We're going to support them. This is how we're going to evaluate. This will be the impact and how we'll measure it. And they'll do that under various themes that are recorded in the joint agreement. Um, they'll build evaluation into that. They'll also, from that, look at workforce, a workforce plan. So they'll draw from that what's the resource they need from across the region, but also what's the resource request from ourselves and Education Scotland or other agencies and, and partners, third sector and the like. As part of that, then, they'll then create a plan. It will be at, like any good school improvement plan. You know, there'll be a phase one, then there'll be a further development for the next academic year. We'll try and align it to run more academic year school improvement cycle. Um, so they'll do that. There is, we have asked for um, local authorities and for regional improvement collaboratives to very much build from bottom up, but we are very conscious of the timescales involved. So um, many of them have um, spoken to head teachers, particularly. Some of them have done practitioner events. I know some of them have done um, online surveys, asking their workforce what they would like to see to move forward. But many of them will put in their plan how they're going to develop that with more strength and depth over time. Um, but very much trying to feed that practitioner, practitioner voice in and make sure what they're delivering is actually what schools and teachers are asking for. That will be the key measure. That, that's helpful. Can I ask what will then happen with those plans? Um, mm -hmm. So in 12 months' time, I mean, will you be having a conversation with each of the, the uh, regional improvement liaisons? Uh, will, will there be a kind of a strict... Uh, kind of uh, measurement against that, or is it? I mean, what? How will these be used, and and who, who will be kind of uh, measured against them? Will it be just the improvement liaisons, or will individual schools be measured against the regional improvement plans? How will they work? Um, so some of that, some of that detail, we want to work through in partnership with colleagues, so that we we get that right. But the improvement plans that have to be signed off. Um, by myself in this role um, as, as part of the team, but we do that in collaboration, looking at the range of evidence that's there. There's an evaluation um, six months in, in terms of how, how's the progress going and how is that looking, and then a, a further evaluation uh, down the road in terms of looking at the impact, because ultimately we must look at, is this making a difference to children and young people across Scotland? Is this work regionally, locally and nationally really addressing some of the concerns we may have around progress in, for children and young people? So we will look at that, but we will be looking at the progress against the plan, the impact that it's having, and taking a very wide-looking range at the success criteria, at inspection evidence, and also what, what teachers and practitioners are saying has been the impact of, of that work. So, so just with a view to the questions around the accountability and trying to get an understanding of who is accountable to whom for what, if a region fails to meet the, the targets it sets out in its regional improvement plan, who will be holding who to task and, 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 and uh, what will be the, the consequences? I mean, will you, I mean, essentially, will, will you be firing uh, regional improvement liais uh, uh, liaisons or Will, they, you know, will, they, will, will the schools be holding them? To, I mean, what, what's the direction of accountability here? So the, the accountability, the regional improvement leads are employed by the council that they're working with and uh, as part of the collaborative establishment, the joint agreement between Scottish Government and uh, COSLA was very much about the leadership of the regional improvement collaborative, sits with local authorities that are the constituent members of that regional improvement collaborative. There is a lead chief executive in each one of the collaboratives who um, is responsible for working and ensuring and seeing the oversight of the work of the regional improvement lead. We would be evaluating that work and feeding that information back to them in terms of accountability for the impact on, on children and young people. Man. Yes, no, just to uh, follow on um, from that and Mr Johnston's point about planning, I think the, we've seen a significant impact from the national improvement framework in that school improvement plans and local plans are now aligned to the drivers and the priorities. So that's almost the golden thread that we now have in education improvement planning in Scotland. So school plans will continue to be very prominent um, and we would want the regional improvement plan to take full account of the school priorities. And local authorities have already been analysing those uh, when developing their own, their own, their 
own NIF plan. So we do have that golden thread based on the, the drivers and the priorities in the National Improvement Framework, and that's bringing a greater sense of clarity around the improvement priorities at both school, local and national level. Yes, one last, one last question, which is, you, you talked about um, Education Scotland staff being deployed to the regional improvement collaboratives. Will they be formally seconded, and will those Education Scotland staff be formally uh, accountable and, and answering to uh, the, the regional uh, liaisons? Is that, is that going to be the formal structure, or could you explain how that's going to work? Um, no, we, we wouldn't see that as, as the formal structure. They would still be employed and working with Education Scotland. However, the narrative is about a partnership approach, and so the, the regional collaboratives would be brokering and asking for that support from Education Scotland, where they felt they, they wanted it. We would be responding to that, and then we'd be working in partnership and alongside. On a day-to-day -day basis, they would be working with and through the regional improvement collaboratives but also feeding back information to, to Education Scotland around learning we could share with other collaboratives or national pictures that were emerging to help us drive some of the national messaging as well. So in effect, they'd have dual lines of accountability? It, it would almost be like a matrix management model. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Richard. <coughs> Thank you, and firstly, uh, congratulations to Ms Gorman on your new uh, position. And best wishes for the future. It's good to have someone from the North East taking such a, a prominent position. And as a member of the Northern Alliance, and I'm not talking about this character in the new Star Wars movie, but the Northern Alliance as in uh, the education collaboration in, in uh, our part of the world, because obviously I represent Murray and uh, they're one of the local authorities involved. I'm keen to explore with you um, your vision for how that will develop. I know other members have touched upon that, but one issue that occurs to me looking at some of the unique, are, some, are, some are unique and some are general of the challenges facing Murray at the moment, uh, and there's clearly an issue over uh, a shortage of teachers and <clears throat> there's additional pressures facing many of our schools locally and I understand from teachers locally there's only three quality improvement officers now working for the Murray Council to support the, the, the schools from that, that, that central perspective and I also understand from teachers it used to be more than double that just a few years ago. So the advice and support they're getting is limited compared to previous times and I'm just trying to understand if your vision for the regional collaboration is you could help plug that gap and then that begs the question in the longer term should this regional collaboration approach just take over the role of the quality improvement officer so there's equal support across the regional regional areas uh, yeah, I do know Murray very well and I have had the privilege of being in many Murray schools and working with uh, a number of your teachers. Um, one of the things that, if I use the example of the Northern Alliance as where um, you're referring to, is that the QIOs um, are actually all working collectively together. So um, about 18 months ago, um, the QIOs got together a working group of two from each of the seven constituent authorities at the time and looked at um, their processes for quality assuring leadership in schools and supporting and making judgments around the quality of the curriculum. They worked together um, for some time and then they ran an event where all the QIOs across the Northern Alliance came together. They shared approaches and, and to get a common agreement and consistency around approaches to evaluation and self-evaluation of leadership and the core QIs around that in, in schools. Um, they then have then developed that further and are doing some elements of joint value, um, uh, I'm trying not to use jargon here, sorry, <laughs> some uh, self-evaluation work in schools. And uh, they're working collectively, um, you know, three different QIOs coming together and going and doing a joint VSE in a, another authority or supporting another authority around that. So that embryonic work has, has already been, been taking place to do that. It also brings um, a great deal of professional learning across those teams as well, in terms of there's, you know, some fantastic work maybe happening here in one area. There's some great work here. We bring that together. Actually, we are should be able to share that with more schools more quickly. So that development of, of the, Q, the quality improvement officers coming together, learning from each other and helping support schools with I, absolutely the challenges that many of them face um, is already underway. And I know that the other regional improvement um, collaboratives are looking at developing similar approaches. So it should provide some of that, that surety in the system and that capacity across a region that is difficult in, in the range of authorities that we have across Scotland. Okay, and just very briefly, because I'll come back to some of these themes when we talk about inspections later, is in that case, do you see the, the role or, or who's responsible for quality improvement officers changing in the future? Because it seems to me if one local authority is only employing three 
and other local authorities are employing a lot more than that. They're clearly providing a lot more support to their schools. And, you know, when you look at the inspection reports you get from many schools, what you'll get back is, oh, we don't have a lot of quality improvement officers anymore to help those schools. So therefore, it's an issue. So I'm just wondering, you know, there is some urgency about this, whether you think that we could just rearrange the whole way in which uh, quality improvement is delivered. Um, no, I, I don't think that's necessarily the, the way um, that, that things would need to develop. Because if we really are focusing in on a, a school and teacher-led system, actually some of the, the, the usually quality improvement officers are ex-head teachers or senior senior staff members. So actually if we can, can draw and, and bring capacity into the system with head teachers supporting each other, as many do currently in cluster arrangements anyway. But if we can build and strengthen that and create that network of professionals who are working across and within their own school, but outside that, actually it will help with some of that capacity. And there is the fact that, that there will be local authority targeted work that QIOs will be doing in their own authority that would continue um, as things go forward. OK, I'll come back. Thank you, Oliver. Thank very much, uh, Convener. Can I start as well by joining colleagues and welcoming you uh, to your new role? Um, on the sort of issue of, of the collaborative, you've talked a little bit about variability of uh, service provision and, and, and capacity. Do you think there's a danger within some smaller uh, local authorities where, where maybe that capacity is lacking at the centre at the moment, that they are uh, you know, their, their, their voice will be less within uh, larger regions and perhaps some of the priorities, I'm thinking uh, certainly within uh, my own constituency where there's a number of, sort of smaller rural schools with very unique needs, do you think that they'll be, do you think they'll be prioritised enough within uh, larger regional collaboratives? Um, certainly my experience is yes, because if you are truly, if it's truly about collective leadership and collaboration, then everyone's equal. And one of the, the core principles in the Northern Alliance was that regardless of scale, size, geography, we're all equal and we all have an equal voice. And certainly that would be what my expectation would be across the whole system and layers of the system. That actually the issues in a, a one teacher primary school that's got a part time teaching head is actually just as viable as, as a 1400 place secondary school and many of the issues there because we're all part of the profession and if we create the collective learning community we're all respectful of that and that, that's fundamentally has to be many of our schools in Scotland are small and rural and we mustn't we mustn't forget that and you're confident that when it comes to setting the priorities for improvement that the improvement for those smaller schools will be will be given that parity it's certainly something I would be looking for. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the, the next question was just around whether geography uh, was the, the best or sort of only method of collaboration, because obviously you've talked a little bit about family of schools. And again, uh, thinking of those smaller rural schools, some of those will have far more in common uh, with those in the north of Scotland uh, than they would uh, with, with, with schools a few miles away in, say, Dumfries, which is the, the largest town. Uh, locally, so do you think geography is the best the best way of, of bringing people together to collaborate? Um, geography can be a significant challenge and also a significant strength. Um, I think that one of the things we must be mindful of is that the regional collaborations are going to be one set of collaborations. There's other collaborations that already exist. So, you know, there are things like the small schools um, collaboration groups that happen across the whole of Scotland and beyond, actually. Um, so we mustn't... Uh, having regional improvement collaboratives doesn't preclude them from working in other ways and schools working in other ways. Um, and certainly that's my experience of, for instance, in, in the, the Northern Alliance, there's the... Uh, Highlands and Islands, Convention of the Highlands and Islands. There's also the island authorities. There's also work that goes on very close between Highland and Tayside, which aren't in the... So there's, there's lots of different... You know, we might, it's not about precluding. It's about, yes, there's, a, there's another way of working, but actually the strength of Scotland and its size and scale is actually those opportunities that we shouldn't close down in any shape or form. Uh, and, and we need to bear that in mind, that for one school, it could, there could be a very similar school at the other end of the country, and we want to be joining up some of those connections. 
And I think that's also part of the unique contribution of Education Scotland, because as Gail said, we'll have our six regional officers who will be meeting regularly, and really they'll be looking at how can we broker and facilitate work across the collaboratives as well, particularly with our, our national curriculum specialists who will have an overview of literacy. They'll be looking to connect and join up work. So it's really important that as well as delivering a lot of our work regionally, we do keep a national overview and look for opportunities to connect work across the collaboratives. Thank you. And a final question uh, for now, and hopefully I can come back in uh, later, uh, was, was just around uh, learning centres. Obviously, we've heard there's a distinction between uh, primary schools and secondary schools in, in a lot of the evidence. Uh, but I've had a couple of teachers in the last few weeks flag up the sort of issue of, 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 of learning centres in that uh, it, for, for some, uh, particularly primary school head teachers, uh, managing the, the, the learning centre facilities at the moment takes up a considerable uh, amount of time and resource and they're getting quite a lot of support actually uh, from the local authority in, in, in terms of, of making sure that works well. How do you see the sort of management of, of learning centres fitting in to the, the collaborative process? I think that would be for each collaborative to, de to decide um, um, the scale and scope of that. Um, and it will be that regional collaboratives will evolve over time. So it may be, you know, they're focusing very much on, on some of the core, core agenda issues around CFE, around DYW, ar around um, the core curriculum. And it may be that over time, they then begin to look at support and networks around that particular area. And where do you see the, the role of the local authority in terms of learning centres under that should, model? Do you think that they would still be taking it. principal responsibility for... Yeah. Uh, administering them. Regional collaborations are about the collaborative coming together. Actually, in terms of roles and responsibilities, local authorities will, will retain their, their, their roles and responsibilities and their duties in those, those areas. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Joanne? Yep. Uh, thank you very much and, and welcome to you. Um, can I just say, I mean, I want to first, well, we're going to go into other issues, but just on the collaborations thing. First of all, do you acknowledge that the suggestion of collaboration, regional collaborations through the governance consultation wasn't popular? It didn't have support in the learning community? It had very mixed responses. Yeah, at least very mixed responses. You're implementing something that the profession itself hasn't given its support to, which may, must be a challenge. You also said that there are lots of collaborations, which I agree with. There's all sorts of different collaborations going on. But this is the only one where we'd be employing chief executives to be in charge. Do you think that makes it different? Um, there may be other collaboratives where chief executives are involved. Solace and others would, would be able to give you that, that information. Um, I think there are um, community planning uh, collaborations. There are other collaboratives in different forms with different mm -hmm. names that are across, I imagine, many areas of, of governance mm -hmm, but in my in, experience. In community planning, there'll be somebody in charge of community planning. I, I suppose my question is, we're supposed to be making, we're strengthening um, education and putting a lot of emphasis on regional collaboratives. And we're employing people, you're going to be deploying people in, when we already have a structure where there's education directors, for example. And you said earlier it was a matrix management model. I don't know what that means, but I'm interested in where accountability lies. Because who is responsible within a regional area? Who is responsible for the quality of education within a local authority and within the regional collaborative. So the, the Education Act is very clear that the duty for um, improvement and for education sits with the local authority. The regional improvement collaboratives would not change that and that's the joint agreement that so was So why are we employing reached. somebody as a chief executive to do a job? Just to, if they're all Sorry, doing is may, bringing people together? You may have picked up incorrectly from what I meant was the existing local authority chief executives are involved in the management and organisation of regional collaboratives. They're right. not employing a okay. chief executive. My apologies, okay. that maybe wasn't clear. I just meant that out of the six or seven chief executives that are in the region, there's one who's taken on the responsibility of helping to oversee and govern the collaborative. Sorry, that was my, my mistake. Mm -hmm. Just to, to add to that, um, Ms Lamont, you mentioned the directors of education. There's only really two who have a sole focus on education, and that's part of the reason of collectively pulling together education support and resources so that we can actually uh, strengthen that support at regional level and with our contribution. So I think it's really important that the evidence from inspection and through our quality improvement in Scottish Education Report 
highlighted that there was too much variance in that quality improvement support across Scotland. So the purpose here is to pull together and to work together to, to share um, expertise across uh, sectors and subjects so that we actually improve that quality support in all parts of the country. But it's also the case that people actively in policy take terms decided within local authorities that the <laughs> education director should have a broader role because they were responsible for getting it right for all, mm -hmm. every child. So we're saying that we've agreed that as a policy, that there should be that collaboration at a local authority level, but because there is that collaboration at a local level, you have to pull something up into a regional collaborative or national level to make sure there's consistency. Is that not a contradiction? No, um, I, I'm, I may not have, have picked you up correctly there, but the plans that are being developed have GERFEC as part of, mm -hmm. of the core agenda. Now, the point I was making was that if you're explaining why you have to have a regional collaborative, because there aren't very many directors who are solely responsible for education, there's a combination of reasons for that. Some of it is there's not sufficient money in the system, and also because philosophically people recognise for a young person, education, social work and so on, Absolutely. actually was pulled together. Mm -hmm. So that's not an explanation of why you would do it at a regional level? I, yeah. I don't want to speak yes, to thanks. I mean, you're absolutely right that we have education and children's services. In some cases, well, there's much broader remits, including other areas beyond education and children's services. The evidence is clear, um, and it's in the, the Quality Improvement in Scottish Education report, that we need to improve the, the variability if we are going to achieve excellence and equity. And that is one of the main pieces of evidence that underpins the need to look at regional collaboration to strengthen that support on the ground. One last uh, question. We had, we had a brief discussion earlier about the role of the Education Council, which I can't say filled me with any great confidence because you said it was, it didn't have authority, it brought people together. It felt a bit like the, I don't know if it was the CFE implementation group or some equivalent to that, where everybody was responsible and nobody was responsible and nobody could tell us who was making the decisions. So if you're sitting inside the Education Council as the, with a role for implementing policy, what authority have you got in there? Or are we in the danger of recreating another body where everybody's there but nobody's actually taking responsibility for saying there's an issue here or there's a concern here? Uh, it's difficult for me to comment on the, the board you're referring to because obviously I wasn't I wasn't part of that. But Graham may want yeah, to. I think that's why the government has an education governance bill out for consultation to clarify uh, the, the governance model in Scottish education moving forward. And there's a range of, of options there. But at, at the first meeting of the Education Council, the rule and remit was discussed, and we would expect that to be firmed up and, and made clear equally for the rule and remit of the curriculum and assessment board. But it's not a decision-making body. It has an advisory function. Okay. Hey, George? Um, yeah. Ms Gorman, don't let me be the only one that never <laughs> wish you all the best of luck uh, <laughs> in your role. I feel honour-bound to ask you that, to say that to you now. Uh, one of the things that's <coughs> going to happen is going to be an expanded role for leadership and a need for professional development. I know you've hinted at uh, some of that already, but one of the things that I just want some more detail, Chris, Professor Chris Chapman said, the fundamental issue, uh, issue concerns how you build the leadership capacity that makes collaborative effective and purposeful. Now, I'm aware in my time as a local councillor and obviously my time in the Education Committee previously, that leadership is the key. It's, uh, you know, that, that head teacher in the school, that's, that's going to make all the difference to young people's lives. Uh, and basically, that's the foundation stone and everything. So basically, it's a very simple question. Uh, how is Education Scotland going to do this? How are they going to have the plans to support leadership and professional development of these individuals? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased to say that the um, uh, Scottish uh, Council for Educational Leadership scale um, are joining uh, Education Scotland and plans have already been underway um, to transfer the, the staff there and the 10 programmes that they run for professional learning, particularly for head teachers and aspiring head teachers, into Education Scotland. They'll move across formally to us on the 1st of April, but we're doing lots of work together um, in getting ready for that process. And so they will bring that expertise, those programmes, which are highly thought of by <coughs> colleagues across Scotland and involve a, a 
number of participants. They will bring that expertise. We will learn from that. We'll grow that. We'll look at also how we develop leadership at classroom level, leadership of learning, leadership of the curriculum, as well as other more formal leadership pathways into promoted posts, etc., and use that to really draw on that expertise. It's evidence-based, research-based um, learning programmes that then develop and support our head teachers. We'll develop a suite of opportunities for that. But we want to draw from the requests and the expertise and the knowledge of head teachers and aspiring head teachers currently and make sure we match our offer to their needs. So we'll look very closely with regional collaboratives about what they ask us and what people are saying are the gaps and what are the issues they're concerned about and then work with colleagues from scale as part of Education Scotland to deliver a more coherent and comprehensive offer ac across the country. Okay, o on that point as well, one of the one of the issues that's always come up before is uh, local authorities might be certain parts that are doing great work in education and they talk about sharing expertise and development and everything else, but it doesn't tend to happen. How do you see with the new process, the new system, regional collaboratives, how do you see that sharing happening? How do you see that panning out? I think it's about, about a combination of factors. So I very much believe there's the, the local, there's three, three kind of levels of, of that collaboration. There's locally, you know, school to school, practitioner to practitioner. There's the regional facilitation of that and sharing and pointing out and making those connections. And then there's also the national piece of, uh, that is actually making the bigger connections and drawing that together and putting the evidence in place. So it's about making sure there's an offer at all three layers. Um, and that Education Scotland helps to contribute and facilitate all of them, but very much supporting that teacher-led, school-led system where um, we're developing classroom-based, evidence-based inquiry learning for a teacher or a head teacher, which then impacts on, on outcomes and their confidence in, in terms of leadership, because leadership is absolutely, as you stated, at the heart of, of the improvement process for, for Scottish education. And Ms Gordon, how do we create the... Uh, the atmosphere where I, I've spoken to head teachers locally in my constituency in Paisley, and they have said, particularly in secondary schools, they have said, you know, th they would like a forum where they can openly talk about ideas and push things forward. You know, they feel sometimes the local authorities got what they have to do, and they, they don't feel that's the place for it. And sometimes they feel they can't get access to what's happening nationally and put their point across. How do we? How do, do you see this as a way forward of creating that kind of leadership and giving them that opportunity to develop further as well? Very much so. It must be about, and uh, I think I said a moment statement about emp empowering teachers and empowering the profession to do that and to take that leadership role and to drive and to have those professional dialogues and, and to really use that to shape the responses and the curriculum and the opportunity because they know best what meets the needs of their learners in front of them every day and we must listen to that and shape the national guidance accordingly. Okay, and just one final part. One of my, my colleagues will probably go on this in more detail, but there has been concern over the dual uh, role that you have, uh, which is effectively inspecting and development of curriculum. Now, I'm interested in the way that uh, Education Scotland write about it as a complementary role. Can you maybe, uh, that's different from some of my colleagues will maybe explain it later on. So can you maybe expand on how you see that as a complementary role? I'll make a start and then I'll, I'll hand over to you. I think it's about <coughs> thinking about improvement. School improvement is, is a sweet of, of elements and inspection is one part of that and if we really want to use inspection to uplift the profession and not to um, be a finger to wag at it we have to keep it as part of the improvement cycle we have to be really clear that the evidence and research that comes out of the inspection is used to then support and drive and share evidence-based work with other schools so it's as part of that improvement cycle it's really important that inspection is part of that process while without fear or favour and, and making sure there are clear boundaries around that actually in terms of not creating a culture that's about seeing inspection as a negative actually seeing it as a positive that feeds the information in an improving system it's really important that we we keep that collaboration and that is is looked at in other systems around the world in a similar way as a very positive way to keep that balance of the engagement of inspection and support across the national picture yeah, thanks, Gail. I mean, I think the bottom line here is, do we see inspection as a tool to improve schools or a stick to beat them with? And the, we, our professional opinion is very clear that inspection should be part of the suite of improvement activities. That is the international direction of travel. And in Scotland, 
Um, HM inspectors have always been involved in improvement work with schools and local authorities. Indeed, it's been recognised as a strength of the Scottish approach to improving education. Mike, you might want to, to add to that. <coughs> yes, um, if I could go back into um, my own history. Um, I remember that before, long before the creation of Education Scotland, there was concern expressed that HMIE um, provided both advice and inspected against that advice. The creation of Education Scotland has not changed anything in that regard. There is still a, a canard in the system that says that um, the, uh, the, the central body is both, um, as it were, judge and jury. And that is clearly not the case. The best evidence for what can improve education comes from the inspection activity, and it should be cycled directly into improvement advice. And it's for the operation of the, the inspection function as, it's, as, as it stands to be independent. And that, that has always been the case, and it remains the case. Okay. okay. Right, thanks, George. Uh, Liz? Just... Yes, can, can I just pick up on uh, that point, uh, given a comment that was given to us by Graham Donaldson, who said that putting the two together would not have been his decision. And he made that point um, based on the fact that he felt that if inspection is to work well, it ought to be entirely independent of the body that is overseeing the development of the curriculum. Do you think he's wrong? I don't think he's wrong, and I'm not entirely sure that um, I understood his remarks to be um, precisely as you've described them, as because he wanted to separate the, um, the two functions. I think what he said was it wouldn't have been my choice to make the organisational change that was required. And but that, that meant that he, didn't, he wouldn't have put the two together. He was very clear about that in his comments. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think he's wrong? I don't think he's wrong to say that there is a, there is a consequence of organisational change. I've lived through it with, uh, and my role as a member of the management so, sorry, advisory just, board. Just, just, just to be clear, Scotland. Mr. Ewart, um, Mr. Donaldson was perfectly clear in what mm. he was saying that it would not have been his choice to put the two organisations yeah. uh, together, uh, and he's making the point that he felt that for absolute integrity of both organisations, it's better to have them separate and entirely independent. Even, even if the lessons from inspections get fed back, he believed that it was not appropriate to be judge and jury. Do you think he's, do you disagree with that? I disagree with it in the sense that even before Education Scotland was created, that was still a view in the system, that the inspectorate were both judge and jury because they were the source of professional advice. Just on that point, it's a question, I mean, I don't agree with the characterisation that the either inspectors stick to beat the back with or an improvement plan. There is, it could be something else. It could also be that it's establishing that the policy that's been developed is unsustainable, unworkable, unwise. And you've, you know, um, the chief, new chief inspector said that the role was to implement policy and not to decide policy. But surely in, an independent inspection system would allow you to speak truth to the person who's developing the policy about its consequences. And I wonder if you think that is an issue. It's not, I think it's a false characterisation to say that's the only two choices we've got in terms of the role of inspections. It's, it's very clear that um, inspection and evidence-based work should be driving any education system. And fundamentally, that's the role of inspection, is to help us um, steer the system and get that evidence that without fear or favour, that's very clear, you know, there's a separate director of inspection that actually provides that information, that we're able to use that to provide advice, professional guidance, and to, for that to be taken on board to help shape the system. But your job in Education Scotland is to implement the policies decided by the Cabinet Secretary. You said that already. You're already implementing regional collaboratives which haven't got the support of the profession of many people across the country because that's your job to do it, and I recognise that's your job. Can you not see that to people outside Education Scotland, it feels very much like a contradiction that these two things are very difficult to resolve? 
if you are both the person who has the responsibility for implementing policy and inspecting on whether it, you're not going to inspect to see whether the policy is right, presumably. Or are you then able to go back and say, well, actually, you know what inspection tells us is this is wrong? Yeah, absolutely. The focus of inspection is about improving, uh, inspecting the improvement of outcomes for children and young people. It's always been about that. It will remain that. If there are things that are supporting that, that are working very successfully, inspectors have a duty to report on that. If there are things that are getting in the way, they have a duty to report on that too. And my duty in the annual um, summary of that inspection would be to put that to the forefront so that everyone in the profession and politicians would be able to see the evidence that's been gathered about what's happening in the system. So do you have a responsibility to ensure that when you give that information, it is acted on? I have a responsibility as an executive agency of the government to feed back that information and to make sure that it's fed into the governance structures of, of the organisation. But you know, can I just, last question then? What it says in here, some, somebody said that it was perhaps Bill Maxwell or, or somebody else had given us evidence in this anyway, that what you need to do, you recognise as a bit of a, a stress with having both roles, you would need to um, ensure there was a Chinese wall between the two um, areas of responsibility. Would you propose to be constructing such a wall? What would it look like? Or in fact, do you think it's maybe not necessary? I think that there has always been a clear distinction between the work of HMIE and the work of the curriculum and support teams and divisions in the various organisations um, over time. We would continue to ensure that. There already is um, a clear distinction around some roles. There's clear distinction around where there's a conflict of interest in terms of, of inspectors individually, maybe local authorities they worked in or schools, etc. We continue to keep a close eye on that to make sure that for the credibility of inspection, we absolutely fundamentally are very clear about any conflict of interest and any perceived issues there are around some of the tensions um, mm. with that. You'd probably yeah. say a bit more. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think the director of inspection role uh, has a custodian and protective role for ensuring that inspection does uh, operate openly and impartially. Um, and that is a distinct role within the organisation and we'll be using this opportunity with the new role and remit to look again at the framework for inspection and review and make sure that how we do that is absolutely clear to the profession and to the public. Rather big question why the two have been brought together then, Tom? That, that clearly wasn't a question. <laughs> the, uh, Gillian? You mentioned that. I mean, the phrase judge and jury is... I think possibly perpetuating a culture around inspection which is an extremely stressful one for practitioners. And I really wanted to ask you ar around the, the, the issue of um, how are we going to feed that down to teachers who find the inspection process an extremely stressful and time-consuming one where they have maybe had inspections maybe years ago where there has been that kind of like arriving with a clipboard, uh, let's paint all the walls, let's re-photocopy absolutely everything and teachers are going in for weekends in advance of inspections when that kind of language has been used in a committee setting. Yeah, I can maybe start off with that, um, Ms Martin. I think there's been a lot of work done to, um, to change inspection, to make it supportive, to work with people, to engage in professional dialogue. Um, and in fact, in the last year, 94% uh, of, of head teachers have said who were inspected and completed the post-inspection questionnaire that inspection was helpful for them to improve. They've 100% agreed that the relationship with the managing inspector was a positive uh, and constructive one. So there's been a lot of progress um, in terms of inspection working alongside practitioners and engaging in that dialogue and we need to continue to bust any myths about that. For example, we've com totally streamlined the amount of evidence that schools need to prepare in advance for inspection and that will continue to be the case. So we do need to keep focusing on the narrative being about uh, a positive, constructive experience. Yes, there's a public reporting element for, for parents, but we want inspection to be seen as central to that suite of improvement activities that Gail outlined. Okay, um, we've kind of deviated from where we were going, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, Ross, then Richard, to come in and deal with the inspection activity, and then we'll go back to dealing with the structure and accountability mechanisms and that. Ruth, uh, Ross. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, and Ms Gorman, let me not break your streak of committee members wishing you well in your new post. Um, 
As part of the government's reform agenda, they've stated an intention to strengthen the school inspection programme. Could you outline what your understanding of that is? Okay, I'll let um, Mr Logan be involved yeah. in those discussions. Thanks, uh, Mr Greer. Uh, strengthening in terms of uh, clarifying the focus and frequency of inspection, so we've started to develop a new standards and evaluation framework. We've also homed inspection in very clearly on the things that make the most difference to the excellence and equity agenda, so looking at progress and, and literacy and numeracy, looking at a school's success in raising attainment and achievement. So we've got three core areas we look at. Um, we also look at the leadership of change because we recognise how important leadership is, as members have said earlier, uh, to impacting on, on improvement in school. We've also uh, recently announced a 30% increase uh, from April 2008 on inspection, uh, moving towards 250 per year, and that will enable us um, to engage with more schools through inspection. We also aim to engage uh, with, with schools across the country, across the, the suite of improvement activities. But the main areas in strengthening are looking at the focus, homing in on what we know makes the greatest difference, um, and also through the standards and evaluation framework, just clarifying the different models of inspection and when they would be deployed. Thank you. Looking at the documentation around inspections, I didn't find much evidence in the inspection documentation for mainstream schools that emphasis was placed on inspecting the provision of additional uh, support need services and issues around identification. That's, uh, the committee have spent some time looking at additional support needs. I believe the uh, most recent figures out yesterday showed around 27% of young people haven't identified additional support needs, so there'll then be a further proportion with an unidentified need. How will the inspection regime take that into account? Because it's been raised a number of times that a lack of emphasis within inspections can sometimes result in a lack of priority given to both ASN identification and the provision of services within mainstream schools. Um, in our new framework, How Good Is Our School, we have a new quality indicator on ensuring equality, inclusion and well-being. And that has been applied in the schools that we've inspected uh, over the last year. And that looks very much at the school's success um, in identifying and supporting a range of additional support needs. It looks at the school's overall approach to improving both well-being and inclusion. Uh, and we would hope that uh, as that builds up, uh, we'll be able to analyse the themes that emerge, therefore to provide further advice to, to schools and to the regional collaborators, but also to government on, um, on those, 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 those issues. So that new quality indicator that's in How Good Is Our School For was designed to do what you've just described. Thank you. And with the overwhelming majority of what we're discussing at the moment, the education reform agenda is in relation to state schools. Um, but, uh, Mr Ogan, you mentioned uh, issues around frequency of inspection. With a, a non-state school, so a school in the, the private sector, how frequently sh would they expect to be subject to a full external inspection at present? So within the, the, the independent sector, the same um, approaches apply in terms of how we plan inspection. Uh, we also, with the independent, specter, independent sector, given that there, there aren't local authorities, we also do quality improvement visits, um, which are planned um, are on an annual basis. And we also have link inspectors who link with groups of independent schools. So through, the, through those three approaches, we engage with the independent sector. But how frequently should an independent school expect to be subject to a full external inspection? We've moved away from a fixed cycle of inspection, as members are aware. So we would be using um, a, a sampling approach to look at different sizes and types of schools, and that would equally apply to the independent sector um, across both urban and rural. And we would also be um, drawing on any intelligence that we gather around um, inspection. So there isn't a fixed cycle, but as I say, through each of our independent uh, schools has the opportunity to engage through a link inspector, through the quality improvement and professional en uh, engagement visits, and through, through full inspection. Thank you. And just one final question. Um, there was a recent issue following a, a special inspection. The Register of Independent Schools recently informed um, George Watson's College that ministers believe they were at risk of becoming objectionable on the grounds of not adequately safeguarding pupil welfare. Um, just a few months before this, a self-assessment at the school had concluded that their systems for dealing uh, with bullying were just fine. Now, without getting into the specific details of that school and the instance there, is there an issue with self-assessments? 
if they can result in a conclusion that all is fine, only for months later, a serious conclusion to be made by the Cabinet Secretary. Obviously, can you comment on individual cases, because I believe there's ongoing um, uh, work around that. In terms of, of self-evaluation, that's why many local authorities and the regional collaboratives are looking at validated self-evaluation, where um, there's that sort of peer-to-peer uh, -peer challenge mm. and an external voice within that. Um, that. So that development and that work um, is, is widespread and, and would be encouraged as one of the checks and balances around um, self-evaluation. I think that's very welcome. How would that relate to schools in the independent sector who are then not part of local authority or regional collaboratives? Um, it, my experience is that many of, of within the independent school sector will, will do exactly the same and through cultures and through support uh, networks. And also sometimes they do ask local authorities to carry out a validated self-evaluation with them because of, of the relationships that there are locally. Is there an issue there that that is then left down to being culture? It's a matter of, of choice rather than mandated by a framework. Um, I think, as I've been talking about today, about a school and teacher-led system, it's about balancing that within a scrutinised risk assessment environment. Thank you. It's something we can look at in the, the course of the, the process. Richard. Uh, thank you very much. Clearly, with uh, your appointment now, there's an opportunity for a fresh look at inspections and the whole regime. And I do think there's still some room for improvement. And I do find that it's an unusual situation where professionals are subjected to inspections that most professions are not subject to. So you may have been a teacher of 10 or 15 years experience and suddenly inspectors come into your school and they perhaps are quite critical of your professional capabilities and your teaching and that can be a huge damage to morale and I think continues to be so in many cases. And there are still cases of tears in the staff room and schools finding it really difficult to, to cope with the inspections process. So I think there's a lot to be done and I, I, I I hope you can maybe agree with this, to turn it into a much more positive rather than a negative experience for teachers' inspections. Some of the issues I hear about are secondary teachers inspecting primary schools, and there's a huge difference between secondary teachers who have taught a class of 25 pupils chemistry, and suddenly they're inspecting a class or a school where there's 30 P3s or, or whatever. It also not taking into account external factors. So the schools in Murray, for instance, the schools have been left to develop their own pathways for teaching and learning. Neighbouring authorities, that's provided centrally, so that takes a huge burden off the teachers. So the teachers in Murray, for instance, don't get that support to the same degree as other local authorities. So they are under pressure, and that's perhaps influencing their teaching environment, and that's not taken into account by the inspectors. So there's a range of issues there. Do you not agree we have to have a bit more of a reforming agenda when it comes to inspections? Um, I think certainly one of the, the messages in my, in my opening statement um, that I've been repeating uh, just in the last seven days that I've, I've been yeah. in post is about working for Scotland's children with Scotland's teachers. And I'd certainly want to be making sure that all of Education Scotland's activity is reflecting that narrative, is recognising the challenges that are faced every day by teachers, their dedication and professionalism to what they do. And that inspection would also be reflecting that experience back and being part of that improvement and positive feedback cycle for teachers across Scotland. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Mr Lockhead. Just to, to add to that, that yes, of course, we want to continually improve inspection. We listen to feedback. We get engagement post-inspection through questionnaires. We meet with the teacher unions. Some of the teacher unions survey every individual school that's inspected and then give us their feedback as well, and we always act upon that. I think it's also really important to be aware that inspection is built on the context that the school finds itself in. So at the start of an inspection, a head teacher will outline the context they're in and the challenges they face, and the inspection will be built around that. And just re-emphasise re the evidence that we have about the impact of inspection fr from the last year and the 94% the finding it helping them to plan further improvement. 90% uh, who took part in professional dialogue with inspectors found it helpful or very helpful. But of course we want to continue to improve the process to make it have as much impact as possible on improving outcomes for children and young people, as Gail said. Yeah. And, and they're, they're welcome words, but you did use the phrase that we have to bust some of the myths, and I do think they're yeah. not myths, they're actual reality in classrooms and schools across Murray and Scotland, and I think 
we have to recognise that. That's a real experience that test schools are going through. So <coughs> I mentioned earlier on, for instance, that if you've only got three quality improvement officers working in one authority, but another authority next door has got many more, clearly that has an impact on the pressures and stresses of the school, especially as the number of vacancies at the same time. And we have a number of vacancies with letters going out to parents in Murray, for instance, uh, explaining the situation and, and the stage it's reached. So these factors, we do not agree, have to be taken into account by the inspections process. And the feedback I get from teachers across my area is these factors are not always taken into account. The, the context that a school is operating in uh, fundamentally should be at, in part of the process of inspection, and that must be reflected by the team going forward, and that's certainly the, the message that um, we would take back. That's helpful, thank you. And just to pick up on Gillian Martin's point, I think the actual <coughs> presentation of inspections could perhaps be reviewed as well, because MSPs get copied into all the inspection reports that go to, to our schools and we get a prior notice. These external factors are not reflected to any particular degree in the reports I see. So when I'm aware of the situation in my area, and I think no wonder the teachers are under huge stress just now and, and pressures, and then that's not reflected in the reports that you read, or going to the media, or going to parents, I think that maybe is something you could perhaps a week look, look at. Okay, thanks for that. I, I've got to say I agree with that last point. It is a wee bit like an old-fashioned report card at times, where yeah. you know your parents used to hate them. They always like mine coming in, but yeah. others. Uh, Ruth Tavish, and then over. Thanks, convener. Um, good morning, and Gail, welcome to your role, and thanks for being here so so early on. Um, Education Scotland is clearly going through quite a period of significant change. We've got all the education reforms and obviously um, Gail Gorman's appointment. In light of this, can I ask for the panel's reflections on the 2017 UK Civil Service survey results, which would seem to suggest that there's actually very little confidence um, in the organisation's ability to manage change. Um, this year, 2017, only 7% of respondents said that they felt change is managed well within the organisation. And that's actually a decrease on the, the previous year. So I'd be keen to hear your reflection on that. Yeah, I'm hugely disappointed um, that um, my new staff team feel like that. And actually, I had the opportunity yesterday to speak to them all um, at an event that we had yesterday. And I started off by addressing that because for me, looking at that, um, it throws up huge issues and huge concerns about the organisation and, and how staff are feeling. Um, I gave them my commitment to changing that. I'm a very much an open and transparent leader who works as part of a collective team and um, shared with them my commitment to the, having that open and transparent dialogue and for them being able to feed back the issues and what some of the challenges are and to call that out. Um, it's very much how I operate. So um, disappointed, um, but recognise that that's representing how people feel. Um, and I know Mike may want to say, say more about that. Yes, I think you, you began by saying this is a period of great change. And that's, that's exactly the, um, the situation. The organisation is not just having to change the way in which it works um, in order to reflect the, the, the regional structure. It also went through a period where there was interim management in the senior team. And when the future of the organisation itself was uncertain, given that it was in scope for the governance review. And one of the things that um, my colleagues as non-execs on the Management Advisory Board have reflected is that in that context, it's hardly surprising that people have felt that the management of change was not something that was actually in the gift of the organisation at the time. It was things that were happening to it rather than inside it. And now there is clarity about where the organisation is going forward. And with the kind of leadership that Gail represents now as a firm part of the organisation, confidently expect that to turn around. One of the things I would reflect, and I'd offer it to Gail as some comfort in this context, is that I and another non-exec colleague attended one of the first meetings of the assistant directors collectively in the organisation to scope out the way forward and to begin planning for this change. And there was enormous positivity in that room. 
Everybody was working towards taking things forward. Nobody in the, in the room said that it was too big a cliff for them to climb. They're, they are up for it, and they will do it. Kavira, if, if I may, thank you, thank you for those answers. I suppose, um, and, and I don't have the full um, details of the survey in front of me, you'll appreciate, but I suppose if 93% of an organisation that I was running felt that change management wasn't up to scratch and in a period of such change, I'd probably be looking to take some concrete measures to ensure I'd, I welcome your you know, saying that your leadership approach is open and transparent. And I think, you know, we're seeing some of that reflected in your answers, but what concrete steps will you be taking to make sure that all your organisation come with you, not, not just the sort of lead top leadership team? Um, well, um, there already are some plans in place that, that Graham can, can tell you about in a minute. But so we've got a transformation plan um, that uh, colleagues have brought together. I want to have, take a little bit of time to review and look at that. Um, I've already, in the, in the last eight days, been out and about around the various bases, talking to individual staff. I will continue to do that because I think sometimes systems and processes um, can be quite intimidating for staff to use. I want to be able to have those individual one-to-one -one conversations. That's part of how I work. I'll continue to do that. I want to go out and hear firsthand what the issues are and really address those and, and look at them. We want to pull together a staff engagement plan where we have a staff stakeholder panel of all background stages and positions who would then be very much driving and overseeing that cultural change in the organisation and the needs and requirement to have that open and transparent communications. I um, have already established a, a, a blog that I'm going to use with staff where we'll be able to communicate and have closed forums and discussions, but very much creating panels and opportunities formally and informally but also creating some success criteria around that. Those figures um, are very, very concerning, and I want to see rapid improvement in them. And where we're not getting things right, staff need to have the opportunity to tell us that. And we need to be able to say, you said, and here's what we did. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to evidence that really clearly. But there's some work already underway. Yeah, thanks, Gail. I think um, in September, we had the opportunity to engage with the whole staff team um, to discuss the fact that the organisation has now a new remit and a new role and therefore to dispel the, the huge uncertainty that Mike referred to and really to, to develop a new top level narrative for the organisation. What is the organisation about? And the staff um, developed and agreed that moving forward Education Scotland is a partnership of people who believe passionately in the power of education to change lives because that is why everyone's in the organisation, that's why people enter the education profession, and that everything we do, as Gail said, will be in the interests of children and young people. So we now have agreed that narrative and that way forward, and we now need to deliver on that and continue to engage with staff to make the most of the opportunity that the agency has um, to work with teachers and other education professionals to achieve excellence and equity for children. And certainly in over 20 years I've been in Scottish education, I can't remember a time where we had such clarity on what we were trying to achieve as a profession, and that is excellence and equity for every learner in Scotland. Okay. Thank you. If I just speak briefly on, on the structure of Education Scotland itself, obviously um, there's significant new and different roles, and I suppose it's not unconnected to, to some of the answers you've given, but what level of changes um, do you think will be required to the structure of your organisation itself? And um, how are these going to be managed? What are you, what are you doing about them? Um, it, it's too early for me to go into the detail of that. It'd be hugely disrespectful to my organisation as well um, as the new girl in the door to suddenly be saying, here's, here's what, you know, we need to, I, I would also, you know, look correct. I'd want to be co-constructing that with my team and with my staff in terms of the new direction of travel. There does have to be, as we've already indicated, you know, some moves in terms of regional working, localised, embedded support, partnership approaches to really clarify that. So that general direction of travel, but we need to look at the scale and scope of what we have. Um, I need to have some time to reflect and hear from the staff voice about whether they think some bits are working and some bits aren't. And also importantly, to hear from the profession and from partners and stakeholders to be able to shape that, that going forward. Thank you. Talish. Just, uh, thank you very much, Kavina. Can I ask a couple of supplementaries to Ruth McGuire's questions? Um, Firstly, to Mike Ewart, I mean, I, I take Mike Ewart's point about the, the past year in terms of change and, and transitional teams, but the staff survey that Ruth's been referring to 
which the, in terms of the information given to the committee goes back to 2015. At that time, 90% of the organisation of your staff didn't believe that uh, the organisation could manage change well. So it's not new, is it? No, it isn't. Any uncertainty isn't new either. But there wasn't uncertainty in 2015. There were, no. no one was proposing at that time a change to Education Scotland. No, there, was, there was uncertainty within the organisation about structures which were changing as a result of the bringing together of two organisations which had very, very different cultures, did learning and teaching at, Scotland. But that happened at what time? What year did that happen? That happened 2010, in, wasn't it? Two, 2011, I 11, think. 11, yeah. so... Yes. Four years on, there was still going Four on. Four years on, there was there was there was still the need for organisational change. Um, the a, a, an organisation doesn't change quickly, um, and people don't change quickly. I think um, it was Audit Scotland who said that there was a minimum of two years um, for a reorganisation to take place, and. That's certainly been my observation in what has happened in Education Scotland. Okay. Um, and I guess you'd, you'd recognise that a lot of us are worried that how this is going to happen in the future. I recognise that there are concerns in the system and what we need to do is bring some clarity to that, mm -hmm. some real clear partnership working and joint approaches mm -hmm. that provide surety in the system. No, I entirely appreciate that. The other point I was wanted to, in this context, raise with you is that the RSC in their submissions committee today pointed out that the Scottish College of Educational Leadership, mm -hmm. which um, for reasons I do not understand has been taken to the, within Education Scotland, is considered to be a body that has been flexible and creative in the view of RSC, and I think that's the view I've had from teachers as well. You know, why, why is that being taken inside Education Scotland? That's not for me to comment on. I'm, I'm, that, that was a government Mr decision. Logan, do you have a view on well, that? Well, no, I mean, that, that was a policy decision, but I think we want to learn from the successes of scale. We want to enable them to increase their reach um, by coming to, to, to work alongside what do you mean us. increase their reach? So that they can reach uh, more schools, if you look, uh, and enable their leadership programmes to reach more head teachers. Um, and there's clearly benefits from um, them working working with us to do that. A small organisation able to access uh, a greater range of channels. So there's certainly a lot we can learn from them and use what you've outlined, uh, Mr. Scott, as a chance to look at how we can learn from them in terms of how they've engaged with people and some of their approaches to communication. How will we be able to know that they've done a good job now when they've become part of your organisation? Where will the line of accountability be there? How will we be able to judge that? Um, so as part of the new corporate plan we'd put together, we'd be, we'd be putting the activity of scale in its new position within Education Scotland as part of that. So we'd be looking at numbers and participation, we'd be looking at evaluation, and that would be part of the overall corporate plan that we'd take forward with that evidence behind it. Okay, thank you. Can I ask one last question about accountability? Um, the minutes of the Management Advisory Board I think you referred to earlier on, um, I looked at the web your website last night, and the last time they were published was the 16th of December last year. I mean, maybe it's not met since then, but why, is, why, is the, why are the minutes not available to anyone who wishes to read them? I'm not aware of that. We'll, need to, we'll need to check. We'll need to double-check and come back to you on doesn't that. doesn't suggest you're yeah. hugely accountable, does it, if the minutes are a year out of date? Well, I, we'll need to double-check. We can certainly get back to the committee on that and clarify uh, the, the meetings. Uh, Mr Scotts will take a note to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Thank you, uh, Convener. I wanted to go back uh, to the earlier quote that... Uh, Joanne Lamont referenced, uh, which I think is from uh, Professor uh, Donaldson, where he was talking about uh, uh, this, this sort of struggle to create convincing uh, Chinese walls inside the organisation to preserve the independence of inspections. Uh, and he felt that was important uh, so that inspection is not simply seen as the enforcement arm of the development side of the organisation. And certainly, I think, over what's been a bumpy a few years of the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence. A lot of teachers have felt inspectors are coming in to tell them uh, you know, th things that they know work are, you know, are no longer uh, part of the plan, that they're too teacher-led, uh, too traditional, uh, too repetitive, and that sometimes inspectors are not you know, interested in encouraging innovation. Uh, wh what are you going to do in practical terms to, to make sure there is a, a clear division? and inspections not seen just about, you know, just about implementing policy from the top down. Um, the focus of inspection is about improving outcomes for children and young people and, and actually the, the methodology in many ways that people do use to do that is entirely school and should be entirely school led and, and focused. And um, as an inspector you have to leave your um, 
personal views or personal professional experience in terms of favours or non-favours, without fear and favour, is, is a, a tenure of, of, of inspection. So some of what you're representing there, I, I, I don't recognise and doesn't, doesn't resonate, but I do, I do understand what you're saying around the um, clarity around we're not inspecting, and going forward, inspectors are not inspecting Education Scotland approaches provision curriculum guidance. It's about teaching and learning, the quality of teaching and learning and the impact on young people. And if we keep it focused on that, that's what teachers have confidence in, because that's what they focus on, is the impact on children and young people. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I mean, our framework for inspection and self-evaluation, how good is our school, does not endorse any particular method or approach. That is the framework and the indicators that inspectors use and they engage in professional dialogue. Yes, if they're asked, have you seen any examples of X or Y, they'll try and connect people up who have a, a similar theme or interest. And when they see um, good practice, they'll look to ways of sharing that um, but uh, as Gail said, inspection focuses on outcomes and impact, not on endorsing particular methods or strategies. So yeah, I, I, I find it worrying then when we hear from people like uh, Frank Lennon, a former uh, head teacher who's here uh, last week, who says that your organisation uh, ought to focus a bit more on schools, uh, that Education Scotland focuses its attention on government because government is the customer. Uh, and you know he feels that as a former head teacher, Education Scotland shouldn't be uh, interfering in innovation at school levels. Why? Why would he say something like that, if if that's not not the experience of, of teachers? I, I, well, I can I can comment. What I can say to you is that the focus is that absolutely, our focus is on children and young people, and schools and their focus around improving outcomes for young people, regardless whether it's curriculum support, whether it's um, attainment advisor work, it, the focus is around children and young people, and certainly that will be at the heart of the organisation I'm leading driving forward, and I hope head teachers and others would see that and would understand and see that recognised in the activities going forward. Okay, well, I, I really as a, a word of caution, I mean, Frank Leonard, uh, Lennon went on to say uh, that is ahead, certainly through the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence. Uh, he didn't find Education in Scotland to be particularly helpful at any level and therefore was sceptical about whether uh, Education in Scotland can structurally be reformed sufficiently to improve relationships with schools. Do you think that as well as the lack of confidence uh, internally amongst your staff around uh, capacity to manage change, that, that there has been a breakdown in trust between teachers and Education in Scotland? that Mr Lennon is not a teacher. Uh, retired but, teacher. But, but answer, oh, uh, please answer the thank question. You. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's been a fundamental breakdown of trust. I think we need to develop a narrative that's about partnership, that's about working collectively for the outcomes for Scotland's children. And that's why I'm, I'm continuing and will continue to repeat the message for Scotland's children with Scotland's educators, because it's really, really important that we recognise the hard work and dedication that happens in schools up and down the country every single day. And as a, a national organisation, we have to represent that, we have to champion it, and we have to celebrate it. And that's fundamentally what we need to do going forward. Okay, and can I ask one final question? Um, given uh, what, what you say, that inspections they are to, to assist and help uh, teachers, if uh, these governance, review, uh, governance reforms do go ahead and there are big changes, uh, do you envisage a greater number of inspections to, to help people through that journey? Yes, uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier, Mr Mundell, we have announced a 30% increase in school inspection from April uh, 2018. But what we'll also be doing is agreeing the sort of thematic inspection and review work we can do with each improvement collaborative, depending on its priorities so that we can get alongside the staff and the collaboratives, help to see what's working and uh, ensure that uh, the best progress is being made um, to support schools and to support children and young people. Shall we finish with Joanne? Okay, thanks very much. Can I just say, I mean, I think it is helpful to hear from you what the statement and purpose of the organisation is. The only thing I would say is that our experience in the past has been a lot of clarity around what the role is, but the gap between that and how people experience it has been very, very wide. And I think that's really the issue. It's not that um, whether the you new know, kind of an argument, whether you're set up in the right way or not, but I think 
the profession and perhaps wider groups who were interested in education are a bit more concerned about the fact saying the thing and doing the thing, and as I would suggest, come from the staff as well, are quite different. Um, can I ask you just two last questions? One is on the budget. Um, in your own uh, submission, you say that you've got a core budget of £21.4 and then received £12.8 in year transfers. My recollection from our budget scrutiny before, this was quite common, that you get a core budget and then you get other bits of money. Will you be making representations and asking for a reasonable budget that you can plan on? Because it does feel to me that it must be very, almost... I can't do the percentage of this, but if it's a 50% increase in your budget in year, how do you plan for that? And is that something that you're um, going to be looking at? Um, any organisation would like clarity around funding on, on a long-term basis as possible. So certainly some, some clarity and and uh, surety around long-term funding, around how that can be planned for, so that in a change in an organisation, we can strategically plan and cover those activities, would certainly be something I think anyone in my position would be, would be keen to clarify um, moving forward, so that we don't have change and, and further change I think as we move forward. Somewhere in our papers, I think it might be EIS said, it's difficult to see where the learning director in the Scottish Government stopped and Education Scotland started. And I think that clarity around the budget would be helpful because it rather feels that the short-term bits of money coming out to you in order to fund a project, which anybody in government likes to be seen funding projects, but doesn't make long-term planning more of a challenge. My final, final question is we also got a submission from um, the College of Scotland, and they're, they're interested in what their, the role of colleges are at a regional collaborative level because obviously that, that transition for many young people is, in, is, is very critical. Um, and in fact, early engagement with some groups of young people before leaving school is also critical. I wonder if you um, maybe want to say something about how you see their role and how, will, how does that collaboration look like um, and how would that sharing of um, evidence look like? I know there have been some early discussions in my previous role. Uh, I've actually met with um, that, the organisation to talk about um, links and collaboration and how the Northern Alliance was working. Um, and as DYW is one of the core components um, that uh, in the joint focus for regional improvement collaborative. Sorry, what's DYW? Sorry, apologies. Developing the young workforce um, is one of the, the core areas in terms of uh, developing regional collaboratives. We would expect to see that those strong links and developments and joint working coming forward. There already is some good work with colleges, particularly given curriculum offers and flexible pathways and the senior phase. There's already some, some excellent practice going on in pockets around the country, and we'd want to take that and, and share that more, more widely. Yes, yeah, and abs absolutely. The, the direction of travel would be looking at learner progression, um, Ms Lamont, as you suggested. In fact, earlier this week, Gail and I visited the Fourth Valley and West Lothian Collaborative who have been talking uh, to, to their local college as well to look at progression for learners. And obviously, Education Scotland, we work with the colleges through both the College Development Network and through our annual agreement with the Scottish Funding Council on how we will both support um, and help improvement in, in, in that sector. So both colleges, both early learning and childcare, they're all relevant to ensure that learners progress as best as possible as they move through the various phases. And is, is the regional structure for the colleges the same as the regional structure for the collaboratives? No. So we've got regional, regional. <laughs> but thanks, yes, I think the college element is an important one. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your attendance and uh, Ms Gorman, can I wish you well in your uh, future endeavours in your new position and I have no doubts we'll see you here in front of us <laughs> on many occasions in the future. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the public part of the meeting. I will wait for the gallery to clear. Thank you.